positive. You were skinny back in 87, but that's 10 plus years ago. They can't say it anymore! And welcome back inside Studio 3 for our continuing coverage of this MLB special report. Matt Vaskersian, Tom Verducci, Joe McGrain, Ken Rosenthal. We continue talking about the big story in baseball, perhaps the biggest story in sports this week, and that is the admission by Mark McGuire that he did, in fact, use steroids throughout his Major League Baseball playing career. This was the statement issued by McGuire at 3 p.m. Eastern. Quote, now that I've become the hitting coach for the St. Louis Cardinals, I have the chance to do something that I I wish I was able to do five years ago. I knew I never knew when, but I always knew this day would come. He went on to say, it's time for me to talk about the past and to confirm what people have suspected. I used steroids during my playing career, and I apologize. I remember trying steroids very briefly in the 1989-1990 offseason, and then after I was injured in 1993, I used steroids again. I used them on occasion throughout the 90s, including during the 1998 season. I wish I had never touched steroids. It was foolish, and it was a mistake. I truly apologize. Looking back, I wish I had never played during the steroid era. We're getting ready to send you live out to Newport, California, where Bob Costas is standing by with Mark McGuire himself. We'll be back here in Studio 3 for reaction after Bob's interview. But for now, we send you to Bob Costas in Newport. All right, Matt, thank you very much. We have a considerable amount of time here, so we'll get to all or certainly close to all the aspects of this. But, Mark, first, thanks for being with us. And let's start with some of the particulars. In your statement today, you said you used steroids during the 90s. You hit 49 home runs as a rookie in 1987. Mm -hmm. Were you using steroids at that time? No. You used them first what season? Well, what season? Uh, well, during the season would be uh, starting. I started using it uh, the '93, going the winter of '93, '94, going in that that season. And I was introduced to steroids. I mean, steroids was when the gyms that you work out. You know, back then, back in the day, that was just that was it. It was readily available. Um, guys at gyms talked about it. You know, uh, I think it was the I believe it was the winter of '89 uh, into '90. I was given a you know couple weeks worth. Tried it, never thought anything of it. Just moved on from it. But as far as using it on a consistent basis, it was the winter of the '93 and the '94. You had a series of injuries, early '90s to the mid '90s, and in your statement today, you indicated that that was at least part of the reason why you first used steroids. Yeah. But then I would guess that the performance-enhancing aspects became evident, and even once healthy. You continued because it helped you perform, right? Well, no, no, no. I, I, I did it on, on uh, health purposes. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, my career and in, uh, injured '93, '94, '95, '96, I was a walking uh, mash unit. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I told my my dad yesterday when I finally had to tell him about this. Uh, uh, I remember calling him in '96. I was uh, so frustrated with injuries, uh, I, I wanted to retire. So um, he's the one that told me to stick it out. And at that time I was, yeah, I was using steroids thinking it was gonna help me and help me. It was brought to my attention that it was gonna help me heal faster, make my body feel back to normal. I mean, I was a walking mash unit. It, it doesn't feel good when, we have teammates and people walking by saying he's injured again. You know, uh, you know. I, I mean, I knew I was talented. I knew the man upstairs gave me the ability to, to hit this baseball. Gave me the hand-eye coordination. Gave me my parents gave me the great genetics. But I was running these roadblocks, and uh, by something I very muchly regret. As you I said, started in your using. statement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's just. 
All right, so you hit 49 homers in 87. Those are great numbers, but considering the home runs per time at bat, they weren't freakish numbers or outside the norm of what had been done before in baseball history. When we get to the great seasons of 97, 98, 99, 2000, mm -hmm. then you start hitting home runs once every seven and a half times at bat, once every eight times at bat. I Could became you a ball player. But could I learned you, how to hit. Could you have, and there's no question that hard work, knowledge of hitting, technique, all those things play into it. Could you have done those things? Could you have hit 70 home runs? Could you have had a, a home run ratio greater than anything Babe Ruth did in his time without using steroids? Absolutely. You think I truly so? believe so. I was given this gift by the man upstairs. Uh, yeah. My track record as far as hitting home runs, my first hit bat in Little League was a home run. I still talk about the home runs I hit in high school. I still talk about the home runs I hit in Legion. I still talk about the home runs I hit in college. I led the nation in home runs. I still talk, I still talk about the home runs I hit in the minor leagues. I was given the gift to hit home runs. See, the thing is about well, you, the years that you were talking about, let me go back to 93 and 94. Those were the two years that I was really injured where I missed basically three quarters of the season. That was the first time in my life that I sat back and I really had to understand what this game was all about. I started studying pitchers. I started understanding how they try to get you out. And during that, my swing was changing. I started off as a raw kid with the ability of just hitting from the back leg and hitting these what I call wall scraping home runs. And over the years, as you saw, my swing became shorter and shorter. And I learned how to hit through the baseball. Granting all that, do you think that you would have hit nearly 600 home runs, that you would have hit 70 homers one year and 65 homers another year and topped 54 times if you would never touched anything stronger than a protein shake? I truly believe so. I believe I was given this gift. I, I, the only reason that I took steroids was for my health purposes. I did not take steroids to get any gain for any strength purposes. But did you get that gain incidentally? For my health purposes, to make my body well, feel Did you normal. become stronger? In addition to helping you battle injuries and stay healthy, didn't you become stronger? Didn't you get greater bat speed? Didn't you become not just a I've very good had, power hitter, I've but an had. extraordinary power hitter? I've always had, I've always had bat speed. I just learned how to shorten my bat speed. I learned how to be a better hitter. There's not a pill or an injection that is going to give me the hand-eye or give any athlete a hand-eye coordination to hit a baseball. A pill or an injection will not hit a baseball. Well, if that's the case, then you must genuinely regret not just the fact that You've been in virtual exile for a while. You got only 23% of the Hall of Fame vote. But what you're sitting here telling me is that you could have done essentially what you did without ever touching performance-enhancing drugs. That's your and belief. That's why it's, just, it's, um, it's the most regrettable thing I've ever done in my life. During the stretch of time from 1985 to 94, there were 21 40 homer seasons in all of baseball. From 95 to 2003, now there was an expansion, so there were more teams and more games, but still, there were 104 40 home run seasons. Mm -hmm. Something was happening in baseball that can't possibly be explained just by better technique or legitimate weight training. And Barry Bonds was hitting a homer once every 15 times at bat throughout his career. In 2001, he hit one every six and a half times at bat. Well, I can't talk about anybody well, else. I understand that, but, but something was happening in baseball, wasn't it? Well, in the it, was a, it, was the, it was the era that we played in. I wish I never played in that era. I wish we had drug testing. If we had drug testing when I was playing, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation today. I guarantee you that. What drugs did you use? Were they full-blown steroids? The names, I don't remember, but I did, I did injectables. I preferred the orals. The, the, the steroids that I did were on a very, very low dosage. I didn't want to take a lot of that. I didn't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Lou Ferrigno. The most I ever got in a weight was, my weight was 250. I finished every season around 235, 240. 
I took very, very low dosages just because I wanted my body to feel normal. The wear and tear of 162 ball games and the status of where I was at and the, the pressures that I had to perform and what I had to go through to try to get through all these injuries yeah, is a very, very regrettable thing. And I, I, I wish it never came into my life, but we're sitting here talking about it. And I'm so sorry that I have to. And I apologize to everybody in Major League Baseball. <laughs> my family, the Marises, but Seelig, today was the hardest day of my life. <laughs> We're, uh, we're jumping around here a little bit, and I promise the audience we'll get back uh, to everything which at least I would consider pertinent and try to cover as much ground as possible. But since you mentioned the Maris family, you told me just before we came on the air live here that you called Pat Maris, That's it. Roger Maris's widow, today. How did that conversation go? Well, um, I think she was shocked that I called her. Um, I felt good. I felt that it was... I needed to do that. Uh, they've been great supporters of, my, of mine. She was disappointed, and she has every right to be. And I and, and I I couldn't tell her how much sorry how much how so sorry I was. When you broke the single season record, uh, the night you hit your 62nd in 1998, the Maris family was there. It's a famous baseball scene. Part of the reason people felt so favorably toward this, and maybe some people even suspended disbelief, it wasn't simply a statistical achievement. St. Louis is a great baseball town, doesn't have a hard edge, it's good nature. Sammy Sosa in the friendly confines of Wrigley Field. Your young son, Matt, acting as the honorary bat boy. You pick him up when you cross home plate. And you go into the stands and embrace the Maris family. Mm -hmm. And you give him, uh, in death, some of the respect he didn't quite receive in life for his achievement. People genuinely appreciated that, and I know that the Maris family, to this day, appreciates what you did and feels fondly toward you. But some of them have told me that they now consider their father's 61 and 61 to be the authentic single season record, that they don't consider Bonds or Sosa or yourself to have authentically surpassed him. They have every right to. It's unfortunate I played in this era, and I can't say it again. I wish so heartily that there was testing during this time. I mean, <laughs> I can't turn back the clock. All I can tell you is I'm sorry, and it's been one of the toughest days of my life, and I totally regret everything I've done. This comes from Jose Canseco's book, and at the time a lot of people said, well, the best thing McGuire and others have going for them is that their accuser is Canseco. Now he seems more credible in retrospect. He says, what we did more times than I can count was go into the bathroom stall together to shoot up steroids, speaking of you and him. That's right after batting practice or right before a game, we would load up our syringes and inject ourselves. There's absolutely no truth to that whatsoever. That's not true. Absolutely not. Why do you think Jose would say that? He had to sell a book. So that didn't happen in the clubhouse? Absolutely not. I couldn't be more adamant about that. Did Tony La Russa know, either in Oakland or in St. Louis, that you were involved with steroids? No. He found out this morning. <laughs> he has that been, was a hard call. Yeah. He's been one of your biggest supporters, even to the point where some people were skeptical about him saying, you know what, Mark worked hard, he did it legitimately. Do, do you yeah. feel, did you feel as if you he's like let him dad. down? He's like, he's like talking to my dad. Yeah, I've let a lot of people down. It doesn't feel good. Does today feel better in some sense because at least you're unburdening yourself? I don't, I don't know. I mean, it just, uh, I mean, uh, all I've wanted to do is come clean. I've been wanting to come clean ever since 2005. And, you know, I didn't know where or when or how. Uh, just been holding this in. <laughs> you said in your statement today that you weren't able, let me see if I can get the exact uh, quotation here. After all this time, I want to come clean. I was not in a position to do that five years ago in my congressional testimony, but now I feel an obligation to discuss it. 
Um, why did you testify as you did before Congress in 05? Let me take you back to that time. By the way, are you okay to continue? I know you're getting oh, yeah. emotional no, here. No, that's fine. Okay, because we'll stop if we have to and take a break and come back. But that's fine. Go ahead. Um, so 2005, it's to be needed to go back to testify. Flying back there, I just, I was ready, willing, and prepared to talk about this. I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to get this off my chest. You would have said then what you've essentially said today. Absolutely. My lawyers, Mark Bierbauer and Marty Steinberg, I meet them back there. We talk about the, talk about the situation. Marty, a former federal prosecutor, laid out a couple scenarios. If you go out there and talk about this without protection, there's a very good chance of a possible prosecution or grand jury testimonies. So we talked to, we were in meetings downstairs with Congressman Waxman and uh, uh, um, Tom Davis, I think yeah, was involved. Yeah, Congressman Davis, excuse right. me. So we're in conversations with her. The, our, my lawyers were downstairs trying to get immunity for me. I wanted to talk. I kept telling myself, I want to get this off my chest. Well, we didn't get immunity. So here I am in a situation where I have, a, I have two scenarios where a possible prosecution or possible grand jury testimonies. Well, you know what happens when, you, when there's a prosecution? You bring in your whole family. You bring in your whole friends. You bring in ex-teammates, coaches, anybody that's around you. How the heck? Am I going to bring those people in for some stupid act that I did? So you know what I did? We agreed to not talk about the past. And it was not enjoyable to do that, Bob. I'm going to tell you right now, standing up there or sitting up there and listening with the Hooten family and the other families that were behind me that lost their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And every time that I kept on saying, I'm not talking about the past, I hear these moans. It was killing me. It was absolutely killing my heart. But I had to do what I had to do to protect myself, to protect my family, and to protect my friends. Anybody that was in my shoes that had the scenarios set out in front of them would have done the same exact thing. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not pretending to expertise, but generally speaking, the uh, statute of limitations on these sort of uh, theoretical crimes would be five years. So now you're in the clear, so to speak. If there was any jeopardy at all, that has passed. Does that have anything to do with the timing here? No, the timing has to do, the timing has to do with the Cardinals being offered the hitting coach of the St. Louis Cardinals. Like do you I think said, you would have come forward if Tony Larusa had not? asked you to be his hitting coach and you didn't knew, want to return to the I game. I knew someday, somehow, somewhere, I was going to have to talk about this. But, you know, it's funny how the universe works. Uh, I didn't expect getting offered a job. And I didn't, you know, here it is, I accepted the job. I was the one that went to the Cardinals and said, hey, we need to do something about this. I need to come clean. Because the last thing I want to do is uh, to put any pressure on the Cardinals players, teammates, and anybody to have me be a burden and not mm -hmm. get this off the chest. So this is where it's come up to. Going back to the congressional testimony, you hit upon the phrase, which at least in the court of public opinion didn't serve you well and actually opened you up to ridicule. I'm not here to talk about the past, yes. but that was a calculated phrase uh, that kept you from flatly denying something which might have led well, you into a perjury situation but also kept you from acknowledging something. Is that correct? I, I, well, uh, let me correct. I want to add one more thing. I, w I was not going to lie. I was not going to lie. I wanted to tell the truth but because of the position I was in and protect my family, to protect me, I decided that I would take the hits. I think anybody's going to take the hits. I've been taking hits for five years. It doesn't feel very good. And let's get to that in just a minute, but just to further clarify this. So you say you're not going to talk about the past. If one of the congressmen on the committee had said, 
Mr. McGuire, that's not good enough. I'm asking you directly, did you ever use steroids during your major league career and said you will be held in contempt of Congress or subject to perjury if you answer untruthfully? Would you have taken the Fifth Amendment at that, uh, Fifth, uh, Fifth Amendment at that point against uh, incriminating yourself? Well, it, I, I don't know how that would have turned out. I mean, I just agreed with Congressman Davis and Waxman that I would not talk about the past, and that's what, that was the agreement. That was the agreement before the hearing began? Yes. That was the understanding? Yes, yes, sir. So as it's playing out, while you're sitting there and testifying, you know it's not going well. Right. But, yeah, I know it's not going well, but all I'm thinking about is protecting my family for some stupid act that I did. This is an uncomfortable question to ask, but I feel I have to ask it when you say protecting your family. Were there members of your family that would have been in legal jeopardy if you had testified fully or if you had been uh, pursued on legal charges, if you had, had acknowledged using steroids? Did you worry that members of your family would have well, been when, in legal when, jeopardy or just that they would have had to testify? There, well, at any time, that if there's any kind of prosecution, all family members, anybody close to you, is going to be summoned to talk to whoever. Why would I do that when they knew nothing about what I was doing? They, they just found out yesterday. My parents found out yesterday. My son found out yesterday. I kept this to myself. See, I'm you, a, you kept this from everyone, from your son Matt, who's now yeah. in his 20s, from your younger children. You kept this from your parents. Yep. Did they, did they press you about it? Did they have questions? I've never been asked. I've never been asked, point blank, that, have you ever taken steroids? Did you assume that other people in baseball, people within your family, people you were close to, did you assume that they just figured, yeah, he must have? Well, I think a lot of people assume, anybody can assume, yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what I've been living with. But I'm here today to come clean, to be honest. That's why I'm here. So you walk away from Capitol Hill almost five years ago now. You're six, seven years removed from being the toast of baseball. And again, it wasn't just a mere athletic achievement. A lot of people credited you, and in the context of that time, Sammy Sosa, with revitalizing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a phone call from the president in the clubhouse afterwards. You're embracing your young son, the Maris family. There's such a good feeling around this. The groundskeeper who catches the ball, Tim Forneris, instead of selling it, he shows up on the field at the ceremony and says, Mr. McGuire, I have something here that belongs to you. Yes. You know, there's a feeling surrounding this that's so uplifting that even most of the skeptics suspended disbelief. You go from that to, in effect, being in baseball exile, uh, the authenticity of your achievements disputed, 23% of the Hall of Fame vote. Mm -hmm. What kind of toll has that taken on you during these five years? Well, I, I mean, well, I have to correct you there. I wasn't in exile. It's called retirement. But you weren't, you weren't out there publicly. That's what I meant. I chose not to be. I chose to be retired. I chose to start a family. That was one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to get away from the game of baseball. I wanted to start a family. Um, and I was happy. I've been very happy. Uh, but to, for somebody to say that I was in exile, I wasn't in ex exile. I was enjoying my life like everybody should when they're retired. How much, how much of a burden was it to carry this secret, even in the, if in the minds of some it was an open secret, to yeah. carry this secret until today? Hmm. I think you see it. We're with Mark McGuire. We're in Newport Coast, California. We have more time. We'll get to as much uh, as time allows. And as I say, we have a good deal of time here. And we'll be back in just a moment.
Continuing live from Newport Coast, California with Mark McGuire, who today, as you probably know, acknowledged using steroids during his Major League Baseball career. At the time that you were doing it, did you feel as if you were cheating? Did you feel as if you were doing something dishonorable? Well, as I look back now, as far as my health and my injuries, try to help my injuries and to make me feel normal, I can see how people can say that. But as far as the God-given talent, the hand-eye coordination, the ability, the genetics I was given, I don't see it. You know, I've heard that explanation before, and there's no question that you were at or near the top of the class in terms of God-given ability. No one thinks that even an average ball player, let alone a non-ball player, could take steroids and, and hit 30 home runs, let alone 60 or 70 home runs. On the other hand, if you take two cars at Indy and one gets normal auto fuel and another gets rocket fuel, they're both Indy cars, we know which one might cross the finish line first. So isn't it possible that you were a naturally great home run hitter and naturally great home run hitters might have hit 45, 50, at the far end of every circumstance, 60? All of a sudden guys are popping 65, 70 home runs. Couldn't some of that be attributable to steroids? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't talk about other people. I don't know. You? I can talk about me. I just told you what my feeling is on that. As far as I, I, the toll that my body was going through and the, the level that I had to play at and the injury plague that I was plagued with for many, many years, I mentally thought that by taking the low dosages that I did, would make me feel normal, and that's what I felt like. I did not take this for any strength purposes at all. I, mean, my, I, I look at my swing, and, and I look at how it evolved over time, where my ball was getting so much backspin mm -hmm. and driving, it was going out of the ballpark. That's, that's, that's from a lot of hard work. That's from many, many hours of hitting off the tee I was the first one at the ballpark and the last one to leave. So I asked, I asked this earlier. I apologize for asking it again, but just to clarify, and those may, maybe just joining us would like to hear it. Conceding that the reason you took it in your own mind was that, at least first, you took it because you needed it to recover from injuries and mm -hmm. stay healthy mm -hmm. through a long and grinding season. And conceding what anyone who was around the game knew, that you were a very hard worker, that you understood the science of hitting very well. That's why Tony La Russa wants you back as a hitting coach. Conceding all of those things, didn't you say to yourself at some point, mid to late 90s, hey, on top of all this, whatever I could do really well, I can do better because of steroids? No, it never no. crossed my mind. Did not? No. Because I, I, I just believed in my ability and my hand-eye coordination, and I believed in the strength of my mind. My mind was so strong. I developed that on my own. And I, a no pill or no injection is going to do that. Your statement didn't mention HGH. Did you ever do HGH? Yes, I did. How often? I tried it, uh, I don't know, once, twice maybe. So it wasn't a significant factor? No. Did the use of steroids, in retrospect, did it cause you in any way to break down? You had just turned 38 when you quit. Uh, in your era, a lot of players went beyond that. Did your body break down at all because of steroid use, do you think? Well, that's a great question because, I mean, if you, if you look at when I started taking it in the winter of 93, 94, I broke down in 94. This three quarters of the year, maybe the whole year. And then you go into 95, I broke down again. I don't know. Could have been, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for some reason, I kept doing it. I mentally thought that maybe just keep doing this and maybe I'll feel better and better and I'll get out of this rut of being a, a mass unit. During the summer of 98, when the whole country was enthralled by this home run chase, uh, there was a bottle of Androstenedione in your locker mm -hmm. in open view. Now, Andro was not illegal in baseball then. It had been banned by other sports organizations, some. It's subsequently been banned by baseball, but you could walk into a GNC and buy it yes. at that time. Nonetheless, it raised some eyebrows. And some skeptics said, 
We wonder if Mark McGuire put it out there as a decoy. He wanted people to see the Andro. That might explain his strength and his home run surge, and they wouldn't suspect something more powerful than that. Was there anything to that? No. When I took Andro, it was over the counter. When I took it, it made me feel good. Made my, made my body feel, feel good. Started taking Andro 97, 98, 99. Was the atmosphere around baseball such that what you were doing and other players were doing was kind of an open secret? And if not encouraged, it certainly wasn't discouraged? I don't know. I never talked. I, I hit it. I never talked about it. I mean, I can't remember ever conversations about this subject in any of my clubhouses I played. Really? If, if I ever did, which I don't remember, I walked the other way. So other players in the Oakland clubhouse, the Cardinal clubhouse, they wouldn't discuss it with you, whether they were using or wondering if you were and if you could advise them and if they might benefit from it. None of that happened. Not on the teams that I played on. Really? Opposing players, batting cage, whatever, beforehand? Nothing. Not that I, not, not with me, it didn't happen. Do you view your achievements now, in retrospect, we're uh, coming up on nine years since your last Major League game. Do you view them as authentic? Authentic in what way? That they're completely legitimate. That all those numbers should be taken as at face value. Well, I, I go back to the thing. I mean, unfortunately, I decided to take steroids because of injuries. But when I look at my hand-eye coordination and what God gave me my ability, I'd have to think so. Did the prospect of drug testing on the horizon, there was a new agreement, basic agreement that was going to come up in 2002. You retired after 2001. You figured that drug testing would be a discussion. Did the prospect of drug testing have anything to do with hastening your retirement? What's what, hastening? You know, that, that you retired when you did rather than sticking around because drug testing might be coming? Oh, no. Or had you just broken down and that was the end of it? No. I, I wanted, I, I would, I, I would have loved drug testing when I played. Again, I, I'm repeating myself, but we wouldn't be here talking about that. No, I, I was absolutely tired of rehab and getting beat up uh, physically. You know, uh, I missed the whole second half of 2000 with my knee. I rehabbed um, all winter. Uh, 2001, I played. I shouldn't have probably played, but I played. Uh, my knee was still thrashed. At the end of 2001, I said, I am so tired of rehab, I'm done. And at the time, I, went, I met my beautiful wife, and I wanted to get, get off and start a family. This just popped into my head, and it's far from the most important thing. But here you are, Mark McGuire, one of the great sluggers of your era, no matter how people view that era. And if I've got this right, during the, uh, the playoffs, what would have been your last at bat it was a sacrifice situation, and Tony La Russa reluctantly had to pinch hit for you. I think he used Kerry Robinson yes, he did. to pinch hit for you. Mm -hmm. That was some way for Mark McGuire's career to end. Yeah, it was, but I look at my, my career ending uh, and my last at bat in Milwaukee after 9-11. It was a home run. So my last official at bat in a major league ball game outside of playoffs was a home run. I don't look at it as the playoffs because not every team, everybody gets to play in the playoffs. So you can't say that was your last official at bat. So, um, yeah, you know what? Deep down inside, it, it probably wasn't the greatest. Uh, I didn't feel very great, good about doing that. But you know what? At the time, it was the right move because I probably shouldn't have been playing in that game either. I mean, my knee was thrashed. Mm -hmm. There's no way I, I should have been playing. Lots of people including knowledgeable baseball people, Hall of Fame voters, have different perspectives on this. Some people say that there's a distinction between what someone might have done before baseball had any sort of official drug policy and what someone might have done subsequently, they get caught on a test or however, now that baseball has a real drug policy in place. Do you think that that distinction matters? between what you did and what, let's say, Rafael Palmero tested positive for having done or Manny Ramirez may have done after a drug policy was in place? I, I don't, that's not for me to judge. I mean, that's for the, the, the writers and whoever votes for the Hall of Fame. That's not for me to judge. How much does the Hall of Fame matter to you? Well, first of all, 
I'm not here doing this for the Hall of Fame. I'm doing this for me to get this off my chest. I played this game of baseball because I was given the ability to play. If I'm lucky enough to get in there, that's just icing on the cake. But I played this game because I loved it. When those numbers come out each year, 22%, 23%, knowing that in the year 2000, if someone had asked, the only question would have been, how close to unanimous would it be? Was that a dagger when you saw those numbers? I had a feeling it was coming. I didn't watch. I haven't watched any of this. The, the only time I know about percentages about the Hall of Fame is uh, when friends or somebody brings up and tells me about it. When I retired, I retired. I moved on with my life. Baseball, as a baseball player, was a chapter in my life. And now I'm excited to start another chapter as a hitting coach. You release your statement today. You've had some phone calls with family members, Pat Maris, Roger Maris's widow, Tony La Russa. You've spoken with a few writers. This is the first time you've gone on television to talk about it. What do you plan to do in terms of addressing this beyond this interview between now and spring training or opening day? As far as what? Addressing? Will, how, how will you be available to the media or is it your hope that in a short period of time, this week or whatever, you can address all the pertinent questions well, and I, then say, that's it, we move forward? Well, I mean, that's, you know, we'll allow the Cardinals and Brian Broto to take care of that and uh, we'll, we'll try to do our best at it. Um, I think just the most important part is that I've come clean and uh, people out there know and I hope they really see how truly sorry I am. Brian Bartow, by the way, is the head of PR uh, for the Cardinals. What if, and you hope this doesn't happen, Tony La Russa and the Cardinals hope it doesn't happen, but what if, despite your best efforts to address everything, it just becomes an ongoing distraction. You can't go to Cincinnati or Pittsburgh and stand at the batting cage without something happening. Are you prepared for that possibility and prepared to walk away if it's getting in the way of your job? Well, we'll take it as it comes, but you know, uh, the old saying, you, the truth will set you free. So we'll see if this is really true. You know, I, I mean, this, this is something that's been on my chest for a good five years, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see. It's something that can't be answered at this time. If any of the Cardinal hitters you coach ask you about performance-enhancing drugs, what will you tell them? It was the stupidest thing I ever did. There's no reason for to even go that down that road. It's an illusion. And look at, I'm, look what I have to do. I'm sitting here by a stupid mistake. We're with Mark McGuire, speaking with him live in California, and we'll return after this short break. Continuing now with Mark McGuire, you have acknowledged that it was the worst mistake you ever made. You've acknowledged uh, in your statement today and then this interview, your use of steroids. So that's not in dispute. But did you ever feel over the last several years, in any sense, it's human nature, in any sense, unfairly singled out? Yeah, you were among the very best, but it's obvious to most observers that hundreds and hundreds of players used. You may strongly suspect or know some of them. Uh, did you ever feel unfairly singled out? No, I never thought about it that way. I mean, I just knew after I left Congress that I knew what I did, and I knew I, knew I had to take the hit. I knew I was going to live with it. Uh, but then again, I knew one day I was going to have to talk about it. So I never, I never thought in that sense. It's obvious that this day and this conversation, in some sense, are difficult and emotional for you. But even now, before you have a chance to really think about it in retrospect, even as it's happening. Do you feel better? Uh, I know I still got a lot of... <laughs> uh, I've been asked that question a lot today. It's, uh, I think it's going to take a few days. You know, it just, it's, it's tough because, you know, when uh, you have to tell your son and your uh, family for the first time 
you know, something that uh, I've hid for a long, long time, especially my wife, close friends. It's, uh, it's uh, not pleasurable doing that. I'm, I'm one who believes that there are personal boundaries and, and I don't want to step over them. So to the extent that you are comfortable with it here, uh, what would you like to say about what those conversations were like with your son, with your dad, with Tony LaRusso who's like a second dad? I like to just keep them private. You know, I've always been a private person, and uh, that's just something that uh, I'd like to keep. But they were, they were meaningful to you. Oh, it's yeah. obvious that they were meaningful well, to you. Well, it was very, very emotional. Uh, they were very, very supportive. Um, they were very proud of me. Uh, they think this is going to be good for me. Um, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I just don't want to be any distraction to the Cardinals. I just want to be a, a really good hitting coach. I have a lot to offer, and I'll be, I'll be there from sun up to sundown helping these guys out. So, I don't want all this stuff to be a distraction. So, hopefully, after a few days, when this is all said and done, we can all move on from this. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's what I'm planning on hopefully happening. These are cliches, but cliches become that because they have large elements of truth. They say the truth will set you free. Confession is good for the soul. You feeling that? I'm sure I'll find out soon. But it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a lot of built-up emotion. My guess would be, you and I both know St. Louis well. Nothing is ever unanimous. You can't get 100% of the people to agree it would be a good idea to give milk to orphans. <laughs> but pretty close to overwhelming. I'm guessing in St. Louis, not that people will approve, but they will forgive. That in St. Louis, my guess is that you will be welcomed warmly. Well, I'm asking for a second chance. I hope they give it to me. Because, you know, it's, uh, I have a lot to offer. I have a whole Rolodex of things that I love to teach hitters, and uh, I can't wait to, to get to spring training. I can't wait to, to teach, and it's just, uh, it's, it's always been a, it's, it's been a passion of mine, so it it's just came to a head this last October when mm -hmm. Tony sent me a text to see if I was, would consider being the hitting coach. Yeah, you know, he has told me and other people through the years that he has asked you either to come to spring training or to be involved even to a greater extent than that. And up until now, you've resisted that. What made you say yes this time? Uh, I think my wife. My wife was the, she knows how much I really enjoyed teaching and for the last uh, five years. Um, and she thinks it would be really, really good for me, especially for my six and seven year old, because uh, you know, the last visual that people have of me is uh, standing up with my right hand in Congress. So now my children can see me in a uniform again. Yeah, because the, the little, the younger children, Matt obviously was there right. as a 10 year old, but the younger children. Yeah, they don't, they don't have any idea what, they, just, they know what baseball is, but they don't have any idea. But uh, they just, I, I can't wait to, to expose them to it. Ha have they ever seen video of their dad oh, hitting yeah, homers? The and that's what, there's, there's dad, look at that. All the time. But, you know, they're so young, they don't, they don't really understand. And they, they you know, they, they want to be Mark McGuire. And, and I always tell them, no, you want to be Max McGuire. You want to be Mason McGuire. You want to be what God gave you. But it's just very, very cute. And uh, I just, <laughs> it's going to be great to have them around the ballpark. You got that M and M thing going. Mark <laughs> McGuire, Matt McGuire, Max McGuire, Mason McGuire. Yep. It's a Mantle Maris thing you got yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, sometimes uh, it's it's tough for the house because I I call Max Mason and Mason Max. You're going to be away a lot. That make increase the confusion. That's always a tough decision when you have young kids. How much are you going to be away? Well, it's it's it was a concern, but you know, being that my wife is from the area. Uh, she's got so from many. From the St. Louis area. St. Louis area. And she uh, lives uh, from Illinois across the river. And, and it's just going to work out great because uh, the kids are, you know, they, they just are in love with their cousins and they get to spend the whole summer back there and fish and 
and, and do the things, come to the ballpark, and you know, my wife loves it back there, so it's gonna, it's gonna work out really well. We talked a little bit uh, about what the likely reception is in St. Louis. Are you at all concerned about the reception on the road? Now you don't get introduced, you're not going to the plate, but you're there. Are you concerned about that? I don't think I'm concerned. I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure there'll there'll be people yelling and screaming at at me. But you know what? Um, that's okay. And that's 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 just the name of the game, and that's what you have to deal with is, is being the public eye as an athlete. But I'm a coach. I'm not on the field playing anymore. Um, but you know, I'll accept it as it comes. It seems to be a fact that you're held generally in high regard by baseball people. Those who played with and against you uh, regard you as a good teammate. Uh, they like you. Many of them do not approve of what you did, but they are willing to give you a second chance. I don't sense, either before today or in the reaction I've seen and heard since the statement was released several hours ago, I don't sense a whole lot of antagonism toward you. As far as the uh, teammates? Yeah, or baseball the people. Baseball people. I can't speak for the fans uh, and the people watching, yeah. but people within the game, even those members of the press who would be critical and might not vote for you for the Hall of Fame, I don't sense that they have a great dislike for you personally. Well, I mean, as far as when I was a baseball player, all I ever did was work my tail off and did what I can to, to help this ball club win. And I didn't really like all the attention. I'm a very shy guy. And unfortunately, I was put in a situation where I had a lot of attention. But, mm -hmm. you know, I did my best what I could with the media during those years. But you know what? I always tried to include my teammates. You know, my teammates were, were fantastic to me. And uh, people knew, but I don't have any one thing from the 98 season. I didn't keep any of that stuff. I gave everything away to teammates, players, uh, coaches, umpires people that came through, I just wanted them to have the mementos and it meant more for me to give all that to them than for me to keep it. Which of those teammates did you speak with today? Any of them? Uh, from the 98 no, team? or No, not, not, nobody from the 98 team, but I spoke to Albert Pujols today. Mm -hmm. uh, I left a message for uh, Matt Holliday. I, I saw Matt uh, uh, called. I haven't had a chance to call him back, but uh, had a great, great talk with Albert. He is by far one of the most terrific human beings and when it's all said and done will be probably the best baseball player to ever play this game. You think that? Absolutely. That he'll be the, the best player ever? Ever. There is absolutely, his, his swing is flawless, his work ethic is flawless, he is, he is one of those guys that is a grinder, he's very intense and I'm just happy to say that I can be his hitting coach and sit back and watch history be made. Yeah, what are you going to tell him? Al Albert, Albert, really, you're opening up too much. <laughs> Albert, well, about your stance. Well, that's one thing I do. I have a very good eye of watching, a, a very good eye about uh, watching video. I can, I can see what guys are doing. Uh, I've studied a lot. It, uh, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing in the game that's helped players out the most is, is video. And... Uh, you know, a hitting coach is the guy that sits down and monitors during the season. Yeah, there's things you can do to try to help out and, you know, uh, make guys uh, try to hit down through the baseball. I have a lot to, to teach them. I, you know, I'd love to talk about hitting, but I haven't talked to a lot of the guys in the Cardinals yet, so I mm -hmm. will be a little reserved to talk about that. You know, it kind of runs against the easy stereotype of you as this Paul Bunyan guy who hit the ball a mile, but people within baseball know that you took a scientific approach. I mean, people can say what they want about Barry Bonds. He was one of the smartest hitters ever. You couldn't get him to go for a pitch outside the strike zone. If you made a mistake, he hammered it. I mean, he really was one step ahead of the pitchers. You were the same way. Some people might be, or casual baseball fans, surprised. Why would Mark McGuire be the hitting coach? But you always approached it as a science. Well, it, it's absolutely a science. And the sooner the, 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 the player learns that this game is mental, the better off they're going to be. I mean, mental meaning you have to memorize and get that Rolodex of that pitcher, where his release point is, what pitch he's thrown. It has to be in your head. And then you have to know yourself as a hitter. And once you start getting those things in line, you're going to be very, very successful. Does this thought ever cross your mind? Um, 
there are skeptics about even Albert Pujols, though he's never been connected in any credible way. There's an atmosphere around the game where people say, gee, I hope this player who I like and admire didn't do something or isn't doing something. Kind of a guilty until proven innocent or I'll withhold judgment till I know for sure kind of thing that surrounds the game. Do you feel that inadvertently you and some of your contemporaries may have contributed to that? Well, I played in the era, but it's very sad to think that they're going to put Albert Poole's name. And I've said this, you know, the man upstairs gives us greatness only a few times through our lifetime. And this is greatness being played right before us. And I just hope people understand how great this guy is. And, and uh, let's just sit back, watch, and enjoy. Because if you're not, you're going to be missing it. You've given us a lot of time here. And I appreciate a couple of things before we let you go. When you look back now on what at the time seemed like some of the most glorious moments in baseball history, and again, as I said, not just because you broke a record, but the atmosphere, uh, the good naturedness, the good feeling that seemed to surround it. Lifting Matt up when you crossed the plate mm -hmm. after 62. Going back to touch first base because you almost missed it. Uh, chest bumping with, with Sammy Sosa. Embracing the Maris family. Can you still look back on those moments and feel a glow about it? Or has it been compromised in some way? No, I can because that was me. That just, that's who I am. I was that kind of guy, you know, I just, um, you know, picking up my son, it was just, that's just what I felt, you know, picking up Sammy, going over to the Marises, that's just the kind of person I am. If you had a Hall of Fame vote, would you vote for Mark McGuire? If I had a Hall of Fame vote, I'll leave it up to you guys. I'll leave it up to the writers. Mark, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for allowing me to do this. I'm connected here. I can barely <laughs> lean forward. Thank you very much. Mark McGuire from Newport Coast, California. Let's go back to Matt Vaskersian in the studio. Matt. All right, Bob, thank you. And uh, we are here in Studio four, Studio 3, rather, having watched the entire hour interview that Bob conducted with Mark McGuire. Once again, we welcome you back into Studio 3. Matt Vasquez and Tom Verducci, uh, Joe McGrain, Ken Rosenthal. Guys, um, I think we all had similar reactions during parts of that interview. And uh, I'll start out with this, Tom. Uh, there are limits to Mark McGuire's contrition. We learned that very clearly over the last 60 minutes. Absolutely. I mean, I think... It was obvious to see the pain and anguish that he's going through in this day. My question is, if it was just about, as he was explaining it, just being healthy and being on the field, why do you have so much anguish? Uh, I mean, they're called performance-enhancing drugs. And yet we heard him talk about, uh, he doesn't remember what drugs he took. He took only low doses. Uh, it was about hand-eye coordination. It was about God-given ability. There was no connection to steroids and performance. And I'm sorry, in 2010, I think you'd be naive to believe that there's no connection between steroids and performance. You know, I'm, uh, I'm inclined to uh, agree with that. I think uh, we've seen this so many times when people get uh, put under the Klieg lights that uh, the one thing that, that I think everyone wants to see, and I have questions as, as to how helpful this was for Mark McGuire, is to just completely own it. Uh, the one thing uh, that, that, that I can't get beyond, um, and, and, I, and I believe in his heart of hearts that he was really believing what he was saying, but the one thing that I can't get beyond is that it was God-given ability and technique. He was very strong and he had perfect technique and he had an, an incredible power, but his power was uh, able to take something that could go 480 feet and turn it into four, 575. I still believe that he was helped by steroids. This should have been a great day for McGuire. A day that started the first day of the rest of his baseball life. A day that began a period of forgiveness. And he blew it. And he blew it because people are not going to believe that there was no link, as Tom said, between taking performance enhancing drugs and performance. And for him to say that, and he may believe that, and I can understand where his mind might be there, because no one wants to admit this, but the average fan watching that tonight, I have a really hard time believing the average fan is going to say, wow, Mark McGuire nailed it, he hit that out of the park, let's start anew. It's difficult to put it in those terms. And to me, 
In many ways, this was as bad as his performance before Congress, simply because it was not credible. There was a lot of steering into the skid. All right, we're reacting to uh, the interview we all just watched live right here on MLB Network. Bob Costas chatting with Mark McGuire for a good 60 minutes. The first televised interview that McGuire has granted since his statement issued at 3 p.m. Eastern earlier this afternoon that uh, was an admission that McGuire had used steroids throughout his Major League Baseball playing career. To steer it back uh, in, in a more sympathetic light to McGuire, he did paint in my mind a rather believable picture almost of a Hitchcock film character of a man that was caught in an untenable situation he knew he had done something wrong but he didn't know how to move on from there he uh, he's honest with the world and he he indicts friends family and teammates and opens up an enormous can of worms the likes of which he wouldn't have been prepared to handle or he puts his hand on a Bible and lies I mean this this was an unbelievably tight rock and hard space position for Mark McGuire. I'm not sure that there would have been um, uh, a better way to handle it back in 2005. Well, I think, Kenny, you make a good point. It depends on what he truly believes. And in fact, if he believes that there is no connection between steroids and his performance on the field, then he was being truthful. I find that very difficult to believe. But in his mind, if he believes that, he feels like he's tang taking the truthful route here. Now, I do think he shed some light on explaining what happened in front of Congress when he totally whiffed in 2005. Um, he clearly thought he was in legal jeopardy if he mm -hmm. came out and told the truth, which apparently he said he wanted to do. I've got to believe that there was a way around that by working with the congressman, because I can't recall any steroid user, not distributor, but user, who's been prosecuted. Um, and Jose Canseco wrote a book in full detail explaining using steroids, testified to it in Congress. And the last time I checked, nobody went after him for that. So, you know, I understand his point there. He clearly was very lawyered in that situation, but he did explain why he didn't want to talk about the past in 05. And, and also Rafael Palmero uh, and uh, doing some revisionist history uh, there, um, committing perjury. They didn't follow up on that as well. It comes back to what Tom said right away. If there was no link, if he did this only for health reasons, if that was the motivation, the sole purpose, then why is this such anguish for him? What is so difficult about saying what actually happened? And again, hey, this is a hard thing he's going through. We can all respect that. None of us can even relate to it. But at the same time, you look back at the start of the day when you hear, hey, he is saying he started in 89, 90, went all the way through. This should have been a good day for him. It's not ending that way. Well, and, and to your point, Kenny, there were a number of moments, I feel, that were, were kind of cringe moments for the viewer where I think all of us, we, you know, we wanted this to start and, and end and everybody to kind of, you know, be it, We wanted to exhale and feel a little bit better about this. Instead, we heard things like, I didn't want to look like Lou Ferrigno or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, boy, we were all watching the game in the late 90s, and he was darn close. Um, so I think it was unfortunate. And I, I would also suggest that perhaps the same bad advice he got in 2005, and I thought it was interesting he named his lawyers who gave him said advice, he may have been victimized by some more bad advice today. Because I'll reiterate, I don't think Mark McGuire's a bad guy, and I don't want any of this to come off as a witch hunt. I don't think that's what we're trying to do here. But, but there were some tactical mistakes made along the way that unfortunately didn't stop in the interview we just watched. I think you're right. I think he, we, we have to recognize this is a huge step he took and a very painful one. He deserves a lot of credit because hundreds upon hundreds of players have not taken that step. Now, going back, though, to what Dave Parker said this afternoon, you know, Mark McGuire is hitting balls that, as Dave said, were abnormal, abnormal length and fre frequency to his home runs. And Mark wants us to believe that all of that would have happened, things that had never happened in the history of the game before, by leaps and bounds, not just by incremental advances, but by leaps and bounds, would have happened without steroids. Hard to believe that, but clearly Mark believes that. I know that ballpark. Uh, I pitched in it at uh, that uh, old Bush Stadium. I, I know where the best bolts ended up, and, and you're right. They were just superhuman, Herculean distances that you didn't think it was... Uh, was humanly possible. I, I, I just, uh, I, I wish he would have got it a little bit more right than he, than he did uh, tonight, because uh, it's pretty difficult to unring the bell that was just rung here. People want to like this guy, and they really want to go back to 98 and think of Mark McGuire the way they once did. That's not possible. We all know that. But there could have been, with what he said, some step toward that, and that step didn't occur.
Tom mentioned the length of the home runs. Look at the statistics, the home run rate, the numbers of home runs he hit. Everything points to abnormal performance, and he won't acknowledge that that abnormal performance took place. We've been checking in with our own Harold Reynolds throughout this busy news day here at MLB Network, and Harold joins us once again via remote from Oregon. Harold, thanks for staying with us. You know, Harold, my question to you is that as a former athlete and one that accomplished a whole lot on a big professional stage, Mark McGuire is a very proud man, and it seemed to us, and uh, let us know how you think, that this is a guy that doesn't want his accomplishments and his career Career belittled to the point of complete nothing by these steroid uh, admissions today. Well, yeah, I, I can see some of that, but I also I want to back you guys up a little bit. I don't think it's as bad as you guys are really making this. I, I thought it was great for him to come forward. This was live. This was not rehearsed. It was not. It was all spontaneous. He wasn't given questions ahead of time. Uh, you could s clearly see that was what's great about this interview. It was live and they had the time to go straight through it. I love the fact that he was broken and contrite, ready to cry, breaking down. But I, 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 the one point everybody's belaboring and, and, and I agree with is the fact that uh, steroids help you. I mean, if I hit a ball to the track and I'm stronger, it's going to carry out of the ballpark. He obviously was stronger. The other benefit was being able to recover. He took it for injuries, and that allows you to recover. That allows you to get through a 162-game schedule. The beauty of baseball and is the battle through the year. Do I have to get a lighter bat as I'm getting tired through the summer? Those things aside, I still got to give him a whole lot of credit for sitting on live TV, answering tough questions and Bob did not let him go, and really having to be there. I think he really felt like he's one of the greats. He really is. I mean, you go back and you look at uh, his ability. Did he hit a ball 570 feet? Yeah, but may, maybe had, it, had he hit it 500? Possibly. But I still think just the fact that he got in there, he talked about things. I thought the insight into Congress, something we had not heard about anything. Who knew that he met with the congressman before they walked into the chambers? I mean, who knows that type of stuff? You know, so Matt, I thought you documented it perfectly, talking about this sounds like a movie. It may be someday, uh, but I got to give him a little bit more credit for sitting on the hot seat, and I didn't think it was as bad as you guys are, are saying. Well, Harold, it's Tom Verducci. I certainly don't want to characterize it as really that bad. I mean, we do acknowledge that this was a huge step that he took. There's no question about that. Uh, you mentioned the word contrite. Uh, you know, I'm interested. For a guy who clearly said this is the stupidest thing he ever did, we saw on his face many, many times the anguish. What do you suppose he's contrite about? Is this all about just wanting to get on the field and that's why he feels so badly? Well, I think there's more to come. I mean, number one, uh, this is day one. And even in the middle of the interview, Bob asked him, you feel better? He said, I, you know, I'm going to have to wait and see. I, I think as he goes through and he's able to be around more, and I think uh, he'll, more things will be said. He'll have a chance to really think about how he wants to put his words together and make sense of the questions. I, I, I think there's a lot more to come, but I'm saying for first step out the gate, um, I don't know what, he, what, he, what he's feeling, Tom, I really don't, but I think out of the gate, this is a great first step compared to all the other guys we've seen come forward. Harold, it's Ken, I hear what you're saying. And certainly, compared to some of the others, A-Rod, and you can go right down the line, Mr. Clemens as well, this was different. It was unique. It was an admission. And at the same time, as a former player, when you hear him say that there's no link in his mind between taking the performance-enhancing drugs and his performance, how does that make you feel as a former player? Yeah, I, I can't buy that one. I, I'm, I'm on page with you guys there, 100%. Uh, it, it allowing you to get on the field and anything that allows you to recover is performance enhancing and, and particularly when you're getting stronger and you're hitting that ball you know everybody yes hand-eye coordination those type of things uh, you know there are certain strands of steroids that even help your eyes and your eyesight so that's going to help your hand-eye coordination but I think as far as brute strength being a, a guy that would hit a ball on the track uh, I would love to be able to have a ball carry into the seats. That adds to the average, it adds to the home runs and everything else. So I, yeah, it, it helps. There's no doubt about that. 
Yeah, Harold, it's Joe. I'm not saying this was the, the, the worst thing in the world, because I think we all agree that uh, one of the reasons he was coming forward was to an opportunity to get on the field and, and, and be the hitting coach uh, again. I think the thing that was kind of disappointing as someone that, that's worn the uniform before, and, and, and you've already said, is that the st he said the steroids did not help his performance, and I, I just had a hard time being down with that. No, I, I, I think that's the one misstep he might have said, uh, but he stuck to his guns on it. That's what was really interesting. He really believed it. Uh, you guys have been around great athletes and, and around people who convinced themselves that this is what I did. And, you know, he's had plenty of time to believe that he probably felt like he would have been great without it. Um, I, I still think it helped the performance. Uh, at the end of the day, I still believe there's more to come. You know, if he continues to stay out in front of people and answer questions, I would be interested in uh, how he learned about it. Wh why did he take it for so long? And, and, you know, maybe then we start getting those answers, well, maybe it did help me. You know, maybe his story adds a little bit fuel to the fire. And there is more to come here as well. Uh, Harold Reynolds, live from Oregon, thank you for your contributions. I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again before this day is through. Stay where you are, and we'll invite you at home.